All right, is this, uh, is this turned on? There we go. Hi everyone, it's Chris here, the Primogen, and uh, I'm trying out a new temporary model for now. Uh, I'm working on a uh, different model, definitely more of a unique look for me, but for now I'm kind of shifting gears towards more of what I was uh, intending. A little less uh, gamer, Bishonen, and a little bit more office dude with a little bit of a mysterious secret to him. But it is time for the third part of this extremely long seminar that I thought I would finish last time, which I thought I would finish the time before. And today we are going to talk about the Anarchs and the other creatures of the night. Sabbath, for example, but also werewolves, mages, and such things. So hopefully we will finish this within the hour and we can leave this particular seminar behind us. So, if you recall, last time I talked about the Prince, the Primogen, and the time before that I talked about social networks, I talked about stereotypes, I talked about <clears throat> your average Camarilla cities. So, today we're going to talk about the other minor factions or smaller factions, and we'll begin with the Anarchs. The major question is, of course, are they necessary? Now, depending on which edition of Vampire the Masquerade you were playing, whether it was uh, V1 or V20 or V5, you will have vastly different opinions or impressions of the Anarchs of Vampire the Masquerade. In V1 or Vampire First Edition, the game was very centered on the conflict between the Camarilla and the Anarchs, the establishment versus the punk, the counterculture, the uh, old versus the young. Uh, basically, power, uh, it, it was a very, it was a game where you were kind of supposed to side a little bit with the Anarchs uh, because obviously a lot of the Camarilla was very inept. It was uh, uh, kind of stagnant. You had Modius, of course, who sort of represented the Camarilla, but you also had Loden, the very oppressive leader of Chicago who kind of established a monopoly of power. He would embrace power players within certain factions of the city. He would basically be kind of a tyrant. So you were kind of geared towards being at least partially um, leaning towards Anarchs. And as time went on, the Anarchs were kind of supplanted by the Sabbat, who made a much clearer enemy, as more people apparently preferred to play the Camarilla. Now, I, I don't have stats on this, but this is what I assumed happened. So uh, the Sabbat became kind of the de facto villains, and the Camarilla became kind of the the standard and then people started playing the Sabbat as well so you you got other factions make, mixed into the game but basically in the early editions of Vampire it was about the Anarchs and I think nothing really exemplifies this quite as much as the Anarch book for the revised edition which is quite frankly one of the worst books in my opinion the, the quality of writing is really good but you never really get the impression that the Anarchs even matter when you read that book it's a very empty kind of setting descriptor descriptor and it's very um <clears throat> it's very limited in its scope of what being an anarch actually means and this kind is kind of reflected on the fact that anarchs in revised era edition maybe even in v20 were kind of looked on as camarilla light they were eventually going to join the camarilla they were just this kind of impudent uh, uh child that were you know rebelling against their parents leadership but hopefully they would just be loyal to the Camarilla at the end of the day. So there's been a very clear transformation of the Anarchs through the editions. You have the Anarch Free State, of course, which was kind of the exemplary Anarch uh, setting. So most people also played Anarchs very close to how the Anarchs are portrayed in the game Bloodlines, for example. That is to say, they were <clears throat> kind of semi-organized into baronies. They were kind of, again, Camarilla light, but more about personal individual freedom, yet still had rules that they followed. They had a very set-in-stone kind of way of being. V5, however, kind of shifted things around a little bit. The Camarilla is much more elitistic in V5, and they're more hostile. You're not a default member of the Camarilla if you're a vampire. In in earlier editions, the Camarilla would say, if you're not Sabat, you're, you're a Camarilla vampire. <clears throat> well, technically, all kindred are, are Camarilla. So that meant that the, the Anarchs kind of had the, the permission to be Anarchs because they were still counted as Camarilla, unless they turned full Sabat. This is not the case in V5. V5 uh, instead regards you as 
you have to be a member, you have to be an accepted member of the Camarilla. It's, a, it's an elite club, uh, as the Anarchs are much more different, much more widespread. And basically, uh, Anarchs are sort of any kindred that is not part of the Camarilla, unless they're Sabbat. I think V5, before we go on to what they symbolize, I think V5 does a really good job in showing you what, what an Anarch can be. Because, again, in V3, or Revised Edition, and V20, Anarchs were kind of cut from the same cloth. They were, you know, punks. But in, in V5's Anarch book, there is a wide range of ways that Kindred can organize, that different cities can have different cultures of being an Anarch, um, which is very uh, interesting and very inspirational for a storyteller, for a player to be like, okay, well, how am I an Anarch? Like, how do I differ from the Camarilla? Uh, the Anarchs symbolize something, and they symbolize kind of the <clears throat> the free spirit of being a vampire, the self-exploration, the self-identification, the desire to not necessarily be a part of an establishment, to not uh, immediately go from one sort of societal hier hierarchy to another. It's about um, kind of embracing, pun intended, your nature as a vampire within the confines of humanity. And also, like, exploring, you have eternal life ahead of you. Uh, why do you have this hegemony, hegemony, or however you call it, of, of rules and organizations when, when basically you have all the time in the world to explore uh, different constellations of, of power and organization? Being an anarch is more about being a, a youthful spirit, I would argue, in V5. Whereas Camarilla is more of a, a cautious, uh, kind of insular... Um, oppressive force in v5 much more as it was in v1 than it was in in other editions even though i think the idea of how the camarilla is never really went away from the white writings of the books like I, I really do like the i think it's the player's guide to the camarilla or the storyteller's handbook i don't quite recall but there is a story of uh sabat uh, vampires about um, canines heading to las vegas in one of the books, which I think is the guide to the Sabbat. And then it's from the perspective of the Camarilla in the other. Like the Sabbat think they actually got away with shit, but in the Camarilla book, it's actually shown that, that the Camarilla worked rather well as like a well-oiled well machine in how they handled the Sabbat uh, scouts heading into their city. But I think that the Anarchs kind of embody the the, the the desire, the very human desire to explore what it means to be mortal, what it means to be a vampire, uh, what it means to be part of clans, all these kind of things. Whereas the Camarilla is very much, you are part of this major organization, you are um, a, a cornerstone, no, not even a cornerstone, you're a, you're a part, you're just a minor building block of this huge um, international body. That being said, of course, the Camarilla is not an international organization. The Camarilla is still very much about who's in charge where, um, like we talked about before. Do the players care about the Anarchs? So this is a very important question. If all the players go like, yeah, we want to play Camarilla problem solvers, or we want to be like um, elders in the in the um, in the primogen, or we want to be a prince and their retinue, maybe the Anarchs aren't necessary. Maybe they don't exist in this town, or maybe they're a very small force. Maybe they're just a like in revised edition. Maybe they're just like a minor inf informal extension of the Camarilla, like. Do you have to have Anarchs in your game? Will the players care if you do? I think a, a common mistake many storytellers do is to, um, or make rather, is to um, throw everything in. This is going to be a recurring theme in this, uh, in this video, asking if they're actually important to have in your game. Because a lot of times uh, with all the splats that have come out, with all the books that have come out, many storytellers feel that they need to have Garou, they need to have mages, they need, they need to have wraiths and mages and, and, and uh, anarchs and all that stuff. It's not necessary. It's really not a necessity in your game. It's really more about what you feel like works with your setting, what you feel fits in your picture of the city. Um, the anarchs can absolutely be a... Um, Oh, this is an interesting statement here. What they can be if you're not careful. The Anarchs can basically just be uh, your scapegoats, your uh, pointless, in inept, impotent children that nobody really cares or pay attention to. 
Uh, I think this is really well embodied in... Uh, 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 I think it was... Uh, who was it that played uh, Chicago by Night? Uh, actual play, let's see here. Um, Red Moon role playing, that's right. They did Chicago by Night, they played the Sacrifice, and the Anarchs barely amounted to anything in that game. They really didn't have much of a purpose because the players were not interested in pursuing that line of, of role play. So, um, the Anarchs can actually cause more damage if you, if you don't know why you have them in the game. Maybe they'll be unwitting pawns for the Sabbat. Like, even then, they actually do matter. But the Anarchs can kind of become a joke if you don't play them. If you don't have a reason for having them in your game, I guess. There are many, many, many different ways of playing Anarchs. Uh, LA by Night is, I think, a really good game to show how um, informal being an Anarch actually is. You have, of course, um, uh, you have, of course, uh, Vic uh, Victor, uh, his uh, struggle to, to become a Baron in the city. Uh, but you also have kind of how being an Anarch in, in LA is of course a very god I, I feel like I'm <laughs> this particular feel it's been a long time since I watched LA by night but LA by night shows many many different kinds of flavors of being an anarch and none of which is correct of course but it also kind of highlights the the very thin line between uh, organized anarchs and Camarilla uh, other settings have different kinds of takes on anarchs you have of course um, Gary uh, the very first city made where the Anarchs are almost on the same level of power as the Camarilla. You have the Anarchs in uh, Chicago that have on many times tried to claim power from Loden, have failed. Uh, there have been Anarch revolts. You have historically the Anarchs being more like the Sabbat, um, or rather at least the spirit of the Sabbat in the sense of young uh, kindred or Canaanites rising up against their elders, refusing to be a part of the the, the jihad, jihad refusing to be tools and, and play pieces for their elders. So there's many different ways of playing Anarchs. Um, I like the, the online forum where kindred are discussing if it's dangerous to feed your toddler uh, your own blood, which I think elicited quite a bit of criticism. I think it's a nice satire but satire right on the edge of being a little too much um, but it's an interesting satire there's a there's a Swedish website called Hemnet I think no not Hemnet um, family family something where there it's literally absolute chaos I would call it chaotic evil or chaotic neutral if you want to use a D&D term there are so many weird posts on that website and people there's like no moderation so you will find all kinds of crazy stuff going on there. We at least expect it. Uh, but that's it for the Anarchs. We are going to rush through this fairly quickly because there's a lot of different things. Actually, let's go back to the beginning. Um, the Anarchs, the Independence, the Sabbat, the Mortals, the Night Folk. Uh, yeah, it's going to be a lot of these. So uh, basically, hold on to your pants. Now, the Independence, the Indeps, or the um, <clears throat> Inkanu, not Inkanu. Inkanu? I guess Inkanu kind of are independent, but... <laughs> um, well of Darkness, let's see here. There was another term for for independence. Uh, but that is a sect. God, yeah, this is great. Great, I'm, I'm doing this before I even looked up the terms. But, um... Independence, there was a term for that. You can tell that I've kind of... Uh, that I've kind of uh, lost my... Um, kind of lost uh, track of things when I've been making so few videos. But yeah, let's go with independence. Are they allowed in your game? They are, it's a looser term in V5 than any previous editions. Um, definitely V5 was going back to the classic two, two, um, two sects, the or even two organizations, the Anarchs and the Camarilla. And the Anarchs are, uh, I would argue that a lot of kindred that were considered independent in uh, in earlier editions fall under the Anarch umbrella of V5. Obviously, that's entirely up to you as a player and a storyteller how you want to play with that, but independents are barely mentioned uh, or barely covered 
And most of the time, if you want to do your own thing, you fall under the umbrella of being an Anarch in V5. Uh, if you look at the independent clans, you have the followers of Set, which are now called the Ministry. You have the, um, the Banu Hakim, the Asamites previously called, they're now part of the Camarilla. Uh, you also have the Giovanni, that are now the Hekara. And you have the, um, uh, you have the Ravnos, which are all very barely covered. They're close to extinct. There's a few of them left, but they're the Week of Nightmare certainly took its toll on the clan. And these are the four independent clans, the classically independent clans. So the Ministry is no longer independent in that sense. They're part of the Anarchs, although that still counts as being independent. And the Banu Hakim are part of the Camarilla. Uh, but V5 also is playing kind of loose with these allegiances. They have uh, not rules, but suggestions for if you're playing on these clans and you're part of the, An the Anarchs or the Camarilla as well. So as, while the clan as whole might have joined the Camarilla or the Anarchs, there's still plenty of room for you to be a Camarilla Ministry or an Anarch Banu Hakim, for example. The Ravnos and Hekata, they're mostly independent still. Um, the Hekata obviously are kind of consolidating their powers. They're, uh, they're kind of cleaning things up after they got rid of a large part of the Giovanni. Um, they join together. They're sort of getting back into business, so they're really doing their own thing. The Ravnos, of course, uh, are by their nature pretty independent. They don't like to be part of any factions. But again, uh, pretty likely that you can play a Ravnos Camarilla, or Ravnos Anarch if you want to. The nail that sticks out gets hammered down. This is very um, relevant. This is a very relevant uh, way of looking at the world of V5. The Second Inquisition is getting traction, it's gaining speed, it's gaining power, it's gaining influence, because they're producing results. Uh, they're showing evidence and proof, same thing really, they're showing evidence of actual vampire existence to government bodies, they are gaining more funding, they're gaining more support. I don't think the, the Second Inquisition is ever going to go away, rather it's a pretty bleak future ahead for the vampires with the information technology and the, the Vatican having sanctioned the Society of Leopold. With this in mind, the Camarilla is terrified of the Second Inquisition, and they don't like independent actors that don't know how to keep their head out of the out of the game, so to speak. So what this means is that if you're an independent, if you if you're neither Anarch nor Camarilla, you have very few friends. Uh, you're a risk factor to a lot of them, and you might be uh, coerced, coerced, coerced. Is that how you say coerced? To, to join uh, either of the factions as quickly as possible to just so people can keep track of you. So being independent of all uh, or kind of organization of kindred in a city is very hard. You have to be pretty powerful. Or you have to keep a very low profile. If you don't, uh, you will be noticed and pray you are noticed by people who don't immediately want to destroy you. The, uh, there is a lot of danger in being unaligned. Um, like I said, you uh, you have very few friends. Uh, if you don't align yourself, or at least have a, a good relationship with the local Anarchs, it's quite likely that they will uh, be suspicious of you. They might consider you a spy from for the Camarilla or for someone else. Uh, basically, the less you interact with other vampires in the city, the more they're going to distrust you. As I've said many, many times before, vampires tend to get extremely paranoid, both for good and bad reasons but they do not like to not know uh, where someone is standing. So if you're, if you're uh, um, independent, if you don't get yourself involved in local politics, you are absolutely going to be considered a potential threat. And for a storyteller, it's pretty important for you to make a decision if you actually need to have every clan in your city. This... Uh, it's very important because a lot of times people storyteller will go, oh, I will have this weapon dealer that's a ministry, or I will have this assassin for hire that's a Banu Hakim, or you know there will be a Ravnos that uh, you know does things. You don't have to have that, and Ravnos, especially considering their clan flaw, might just be passing through town and then be on their business, be on their way. So don't be afraid to. Uh, not have certain clans being present in your city. The game is not going to be worse just because you don't have a Ravnos in it or don't have a, a, a Hikata 
Or you can have a lot of Hikata. You can have an entire city run by the Giovanni that gets taken over by the Hikata. Uh, I ran a game online where it was uh, a Hikata game only, where they were basically coming back to Chicago to reclaim their uh, their assets from a Giovanni agent gone rogue. And that was a pretty interesting game. So running a Hikata only game is, is, is definitely a good, good idea if you want to do that. Let's move on to the Sabbat. Are they still around? Now, I made this seminar uh, long, long before the Sabbat book got published. So we knew nothing in V5 about the Sabbat. Uh, but what we do know is that a major part of the Sabbat leadership has left for the Middle East. They uh, went there to wage their Gehenna war, which means that the Sabbat is extremely decentralized. Uh, the Sabbat at the end of Revised Era was a very organized body, a very hierarchical body of, uh, especially the higher up you get, the higher up you went, the more like the Camarilla it was. You can you can absolutely argue um, argue terms, but I would say that the Sabbat were even more organized in that sense than the Camarilla were because they had a centralized leadership. You had bishops, you had archbishops running uh, regions, bishops running cities, you had the um, the uh, the higher council, I, no, not the council, but you had the regent, um, the regent's um, uh, chosen, I think, archbishops that were in their inner council. You had, um, had a lot of organization because the Sabbat is an army, of course, and the army has to have some kind of leadership. When you get down to uh, war bands or, or packs, rather, then th this kind of organization might dissolve. It's very e explosive. Things can change very quickly. But the Sabbat was always a very organized body of, of, of canines. Not so much anymore due to the um, loss of a major part of their leadership. Uh, most major Sabbat strongholds have fallen. Montreal, no longer Sabbat. Mexico City, no longer Sabbat. I believe that Madrid, interestingly, all these cities start with an M. I've never thought about that before. Uh, Madrid, I believe, is still a Sabbat city. I'm not sure. Uh, but Montreal, which was the spiritual heart of the American Sabbat, and Mexico City, which was the political heart of the Sabbat in America, in North America at least, they're gone. They, they, they're now Camarilla. Montreal is part of the um, Chapters uh, board game that's being in development that's going to be shipped pretty soon, I believe. And Mexico City um, is ruled by Fiorenza. Uh, what was her last name again? Fiorenza. Uh, Victor, my boy! Fiorenza Savon. Um, she is the premier of Mexico City. So Mexico City has, has fallen, Sabbat are dispersed. And the La Sombra have in majority left the Sabbat. Not only have they in majority left the Sabbat, they've also sacrificed and killed a significant amount of Sabbat loyal La Sombra. So the La Sombra who were the leadership, wore the leadership hat of the Sabbat in, in most cases, they're gone. Uh, they're in the, in the Camarilla, most of them. <clears throat> What remains are fanatics, extremists, most of them pretty young. Uh, there's a very, very powerful commitment to the Sabbat cause. But the Sabbat have, have gone from an actual army to more of a guerrilla war force. Um, the Sabbat book is pretty interesting in that sense. I, I believe that the war packs survived the most because they have a very tight... Uh, they have a very tight relationship with each other. They have a lot of retail or rituals that they use together. Um, but they don't really have a lot of communication going on. The Sabbat also, by the way, in V5, care extremely little for your clan. They follow paths instead. And these paths kind of decide their their disciplines and their uh, all those kind of things. So Sabbat is pretty different in V5. Um, I did not know that they were going to go so far away from clans, but I think it makes sense because clans, of course, are just a symbol of you being a descendant of a certain antediluvian. And in a, in a meta gaming sense, um, out of character, meta gaming wise, of course, your clan decides your disciplines and your weaknesses. So, so, so your clan matters for a player, but your clan really shouldn't matter uh, to your Sabbat player, Sabbat character that much. 
I mean, the Sombra and Tsimitsi or Tsimish or whatever you want to call them, I guess they, they have this pride that they've killed their uh, antediluvians. Uh, spoiler, they haven't. Both of them are still around. But in a sense, if you were anti-tribu, uh, you, like, you weren't part of that clan. That's specifically what anti-tribu means, it's like counter-clan. You were not part of that clan. So it makes sense to have that kind of transition to, to, to paths more. Um, they, oh, are they a threat? I would argue the Sabbat are extremely dangerous in the sense that they have very little to lose right now. Uh, they kind of shed their, their weaker, their less convinced members. They joined the Camarilla. So in a sense, the Sabbat is extremely dangerous. Ooh, I'm gonna sneeze. <coughs> <coughs> Ooh, pardon me. Uh, in a sense, the Sabbat is extremely dangerous because they have little to lose. In another, they're not quite that, that dangerous because they're uh, very disorganized at the moment. And they've lost a large uh, chunk of their their uh, their domain. It's about power and influence and self conviction. I've spoken a little bit about this. The Sabbat, um, the very fact that Sabbat will have cities that they rule over, it's. Um, I, I guess if you look at it as a war that you're waging over thousands of years, you'd be like, yeah, this is the. New York front, or this is the Mexico City front, or this is the headquarters of this and that. But the Sabbat, um, Sabbat had a lot of internal strife. Um, revised era Sabbat books, uh, even V20 era Sabbat books are rife with internal conflicts. You have the Black Hand, you have the true Black Hand, the Talmacher, Talmacher whatever they're called, I don't care about them, they're gone. In V5, they're they're absolutely gone. They kind of imploded after the realization that they were being manipulated by someone else. Um, you have the true Black Hand, or no, the the um, the Children of Cain, who are the Black Hand. I should probably revisit my own videos, but they're probably still around. A lot of Bano Hakim. but the Sabbat in itself definitely became kind of what they was trying to fight. So I think in V5, you absolutely have a more uh, hardened, more raw, more uh, wicked Sabbat. That can still be played, but they are certainly far less human than they were. And they were still, I would argue that they'd gotten more human in Revised Era, simply because of their obsession with, with uh, power and temporary things. Let's move on to the mortals. I, I, I'm going to make a prediction, by the way, this is probably going to be the most argued against part of this video. Um, I, I admit I'm not super read up on the Sabbat because I did I did do a, a review of the latest book of V5, uh, but it, that was a while ago and I read it once and I've had a trouble getting back into reading. So, and of course, the Sabbat, V5 Sabbat is a very hot topic of discussion and debate. I personally think that uh, there is no reason for you to have to do what D5 does with the Sabbat if you don't want to. Uh, you can pretty quickly... God, I've spoken about this so many times. But you can, you can, you can absolutely have a path of conviction out of your uh, humanity. Humanity is a misnomer. It's basically just a meter to sh see how close to the beast you are. Uh, and you can just have your uh, touchstones and your convictions be less human. Basically, there's, there's even homebrew rules for that. But the Sabbat, as it's described in V5, is extremely disorganized at the moment. Now the mortals, which I consider the most boring but most essential part of a World of Darkness game. I'm gonna go out and say it, every World of Darkness game needs to have mortals. And Vampire does and often does it pretty well. Werewolf didn't to the same extent, they had kinfolk. Kinfolk are not mortals, they're kinfolk. And that is, in my opinion, one of the biggest flaws of Werewolf the Apocalypse. There's a, there's a couple of few things, I spoke about it in an hour long video. Uh, W5 is on its way, interestingly enough. Uh, they just decided to do a soft reboot, which I personally think is the only way, the only way you can launch a new Werewolf title in 2022. Uh, for many, many different reasons, uh, I, w many of which I talked about in, in my video. But one of the biggest flaws in, in Werewolf uh, earlier editions is the fact that mortals are kind of immediately repulsed by Garou. If you are an Arun, 95, at least 95% of all people across the world will immediately try to get away from you 
it doesn't matter if you're in mortal form or in wolf form or or crinos or whatever uh, you just are repellent to normal human beings uh this kind of immediately fostered the sense that Garou are insular, they're on their own, they don't hang with people outside of kinfolk. Um, generally, like, there was no point in you raising rage uh, if, you were, uh, if you were a low rage uh, werewolf, because then you would lose one of your biggest, um, your biggest contribution to the pack, which was that you could actually talk to normal human beings without scaring them away. So, mortals are really important. And the reason I think they're really important is because they are the um, they they represent what you have lost. They represent what you uh, need. They represent uh, the major opposition of your existence. A werewolf kind of turn into this pastiche Captain Planet kill the bad guys sort of game. It doesn't have to. It often did. Uh, but one of the biggest problems was that it was really really hard to work with mortals. On a plane of where you can actually influence them to make changes themselves. A lot of times Garou would consider themselves as the only ones who could bring about a change. And leaving the mortals out of the equation. They kill the mortals, uh, all the ones in charge. And that will stop what's happening to the planet. And these days we know that it's more of a collective thing. We have to do different things. We might have to change our way of life. Anyway, I'm straying very far away from the topic, but mortals are very important in every single World of Darkness game because they they are your uh, reflection. I wouldn't say dark reflection, I would say they are your light reflection. They are what you may have lost, what you may aspire to become again, uh, what you are up against, or who rely on you. They should probably play a bigger role than they usually do, and I've already outlined all the many different reasons why I think so. But they're also, if you think about it, in a city um, of Camarilla City, there should be like one vampire per 100,000 people. That's the, that's the optimal, optimal uh, quantity of vampires per capita. And 100,000 people, that means there should be a lot more NPCs that are not vampires than there are vampires. Obviously, you don't want to sit down and write, let's say you have a city of 11 kindred. That's 1.1 million mortals. You don't want to have to create 1.1 million NPCs. Although I'm sure there's someone out there making an NPC book of that many people. Uh, but there will definitely be a lot of mortals that have a lot of influence and impact on the world you're playing in. They vastly outnumber the kindred. They are not just food. They are everything. They're lovers, they're family, they're food. They are enemies, they are allies, they are parents, they are everything, everything. They are journalists, they are authors, they are police officers, firemen, they are potential new kindred. They're everything. So mortals really do matter a lot. And mortal institutions do exist for a reason. Anything from the IRS to the FBI were created for a specific reason. You don't... I, I know bureaucracy can sometimes appear to be a little dense. And sometimes I can imagine that certain bureaucracies are like, why do these guys even... What, what, what is their job? Is their job just to do what everyone else is doing? But the IRS and the FBI, they fulfill a very specific purpose. The IRS keep tabs, of course, on people's taxes, and the FBI investigate federal crimes, such as murder and kidnapping. So, um, you know, or mass murder or, or serial killing, I guess. But basically, uh, you are bound to kind of run into these guys if you're a kindred. They are also potent allies and enemies. Give them some motivation. So um, if you're having a vampire hunter in the city, why are they a vampire hunter? There's been a plethora of content written and games made about vampire hunters. And they really, I mean, Hunter, The Reckoning, the new Hunter game system is, is very much in tune with V5 in the sense of creating mortal enemies. But as a kindred, you might even be cooperating with the hunters. Maybe you, uh, maybe you don't want to be a vampire. Maybe you are actually helping them out because you believe that your own kind is, is beyond redemption. Um, the masquerade is also very elastic. Like if you if you look at the world we live in, 2022, and if you consider how how advanced our technology, our surveillance technology is, how, how our cell phone, everyone's carrying around a cell phone that can in immediately stream to thousands of people, potentially. I mean, yeah, potentially. Um, it wouldn't be too hard for a vampire to be caught on camera. So there has to be a kind of suspension of disbelief, suspension of belief, I believe, 
it's called, uh, regarding the Masquerade. Because realistically, uh, the Masquerade would not function in 2022. I, I sincerely doubt it would, it would hold up. Um, although, to be honest, there's weirder stuff online, so maybe they just, the Camarilla really just have a very good PR group, a bunch of Nosferatu sitting around uh, with about, like a million Twitter accounts, um, disproving or, or, or spamming actual evidence, which might be fun for itself. But the, the Masquerade is very elastic, it leaves a lot of room for funny, quirky, dangerous situations to arise. Let's say, for example, that uh, you did get caught on ca on tape, and, and you have to get rid of that video before the prince finds out. So you go to the local Nosferatu, and they're like, "Yeah, yeah, we'll bring it, we'll take it down for you, but it's gonna cost you." So you know, you you absolutely you can uh, you can play around with these kind of situations. I have a cat outside my room screaming. I don't know if you can hear that. I'll I'll finish the video soon. Well, we're only 35 minutes in. That's pretty cool. So, the other night folk, are they relevant? <clears throat> and what I mean by night folk is uh, Garou, mages, um, wraiths, changelings, um, other shapeshifters, uh, I don't think hunters anymore, demons. Are they relevant? The short answer is no. Um, like I said before, we tend to have a a, a, a want to kind of immerse our players in this world of darkness and just throw everything in the kitchen sink at them and be like, yeah, in this session I'm gonna have a, a were rat attack them and in this session I'm gonna have them encounter a cabal of magi and in this session they're gonna meet a puka. You know, you don't have to. Uh, and uh, the problem is that if you're playing with newer players especially, you really shouldn't over... Um, you really shouldn't make the world of darkness be too... Uh, too bright and what I mean by too bright is not to make it too happy But rather don't shine a flashlight on every single aspect of the world of darkness It's perfectly fine to have a killer come and go mysteriously unseen uh, Untraced by everything but the, the leaving behind a pile of ash You don't have to know as a storyteller what was what it was that killed the primogen <laughs> Sorry I was just trying to listen if my cat was going to make any more noises. He's just sitting outside my door screaming. Um, but um, you don't have to even know yourself who did something. Because th that's the point of World of Darkness, in my opinion. The World of Darkness is a dark place where strange things happen that you can't explain. And the more you try to explain things, and if you start introducing a pack of Garou, and you'd be like, oh, that's a... That's a uh, uh, you know, Silver Fang, or, or that's a Glass Walker, or that's a, a, children of Gaia, a Child of Gaia, you, you kind of devalue the mystery of the game. So don't keep your cards close to the hand. What I mean is keep your cards close to your heart, uh, or up your sleeve, or whatever you want to keep them, and, and have the players guessing. This is uh, relevant in, bo in two scenarios. If the players are new to the world, they're going to have a difficult enough time keeping track of all the vampire stuff. You don't want to overwhelm them with even more stuff. And if they're experienced players, you don't want them... Like, they're immediately going to start guessing as players. They'd be like, oh, maybe it was a La Sombra. Maybe it was, uh, maybe it was uh, this or that. That's fine. But you don't want to make it too obvious. It's fine to make it contradict itself. Because again, it's a world of darkness. A lot of times when... Bloodlines were introduced, like the True Bruja or the Kiasid. Um, they were introduced to add, a ele add an element of mystery to the game. They were introduced to allow the storyteller to have a cool, interesting NPC that would do weird things that the players can't do. Uh, and of course, the natural reactions of the players are, I want to play that. Um, so that's kind of how things went. Uh, but, but there's no reason for you to, to, to spell out what you're introducing to a game. Okay, so yeah, they, they, they can be relevant as well. Um, <laughs> I think I might have gone a little bit ahead of myself and already talked about all this stuff, but don't abuse uh, other splats. If you're gonna have a were rat in your game, you really want to make that matter. You don't want to throw a half a dozen were rats at the players and have them kill them all and then that's, that's the end of it. Uh, if you have a, a were rat, give them a motivation, give them a character, a voice, give them, you know, uh, a reason to do what they're doing. Uh, if you're gonna have a mage, 
research that uh, tradition, uh, research that form of magic, um, make a story, an adventure revolving around this mage, make it a big part of your game. Because otherwise you're, you're really kind of, you're Dungeons and dragons in it. If you know what I mean, you're you're making it. Oh, it's getting pretty hot in here. Hold on. What you, what you're doing is you're um, you're devaluing the mystery. You're devaluing the 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 player's experience because you're just throwing another monster at them that can you know what what do we get if we kill this were rat? You don't want to have that mentality in a in a World of Darkness game. You don't want to have the mentality of how what kind of cool loot can I get off the body of this guy? That should never ever be the main motivation for a fight to be like i'm gonna get this guy's loot because that's so that's so off from the themes of world of darkness uh you know if you know what i mean like it's it's such a weird way of looking at this kind of role playing again mind you this is my these are my thoughts this is my approach to it you absolutely if you want to have a splatter fest if you want to play for more and just kill garou that that's fine there's even rules for that um, but in my opinion, I think it kind of really devalues the world of darkness if you, if you kind of just uh, make it a, a roller coaster of things to kill. Um, so there's that. The splats matter, of course. Uh, mages are different threats than Garou. Um, to elaborate on what I, said, what I said before, a mage is more likely to ally themselves temporarily with a vampire. A mage is more likely to have an entirely different outlook on the world than a Garou would have. It's very rare for a Garou to, to be friendly with a kindred, especially a kindred of low humanity. Uh, and then you often don't act alone. Mages tend to act alone most of the time. I, yes, I get it. You, you make cabals in mage. I think that's actually um, one of the mage's biggest weaknesses because mage is all about having your own perception of how the world works. So throwing yourself together with a bunch of other mages who have vastly different ideas of how the world works, that uh, kind of that kind of um, makes for a lot of in inner party conflicts. So mages often operate alone uh, or meet up every now and then, whereas a guru will absolutely uh, be in a pack. It's very rare for you to find a ronin, a, a so single guru. Night folks in your court, it's less likely than you think. So I have a pet peeve and it's called the true black hand. And the True Black Hand has an abomination on the cover, the, the book, the V20 book. I know there are abominations in the True Black Hand, in the Talmahera, or however you say that, I don't care. I hate that group. I have not read the V20 book, so it might be better. It's probably a lot better than the original uh, Dirty Secrets of the Black Hand. I don't care. I don't care. I, I do not like abominations. I think they're stupid. Um, and I think they're a result of... Uh, of people being bored and taking things to their logical conclusion. I It blows my mind that there are rules for how to make a vampire werewolf. It should not exist in my opinion. It's stupid. I said it. It's my opinion. It's stupid. So you might be tempted to have a mage or god forbid an abomination in your vampire court consider how incredibly rare these things are um and consider what would they actually profit from being in this court are you putting them in there to add some spice and variety to your game or do you actually have a really good reason for doing that now this is not so much a problem in homebrew game or home games as in larps and i'm gonna step on some toes here but i was i was I played a LARP once, um, a vampire LARP, a, a one shot that I went to, where one of the people in charge of the game, one of the uh, storytellers who also was a player, was playing an abomination. And I think that might have just firmly established in my mind how utterly bizarre and stupid they are. And it's like, there are going to be people who really want to be super powerful. They want to feel powerful. They want to feel like they're able to do things they can't as a human being. Uh, that's cool. But maybe if the group is okay with that. But it, I, I personally think that, um, especially vampire role playing, but role playing in general is a communal effort. So if your self, if your satisfaction is at the expense of other people's satisfaction in the group. 
you might want to reevaluate why you're role playing because I, I think the the more fun the group has, the better the game. So if if you are if you're gonna have to if you're gonna be lording over the other players, if you make a very powerful character and you like challenge the other players to show who's got the most discipline points, um, consider if the other people actually enjoy that. They might, they might, and if they do, uh, all the glory and bully to them. Is it bully to to them? Surprising, I think bully to you is like actually a good thing. Anyway, I'm getting off on a tangent, uh, and this is kind of a kind of a, a personal opinion, of course. Um, I, I would personally never play in a game where there was an abomination, especially not as a player. Uh, and if there is one, they really ought to matter a lot because that is incredibly rare. Uh, and it's a creature that, I mean, by White Wolf's own explanation, should not even exist. It's like an, it's an abomination. Obviously, I was thinking ahead when I wrote this, so read up but don't spoil it keep them unknown like i said before nothing ruins the game like nothing ruins sausages like seeing how they're being made uh, i think about this expression quite a lot um you don't have to explain everything that it happens in the game you don't have to spell out you don't have to say oh you see a were rat approaching you or you, you see a <laughs> you see a were shark with a boner because again let me just reiterate i don't know if you've seen my rokea video where sharks are apparently constantly turned on when when they're on land now you know i have to know this so you have to know this as well this is in the books it's in the book it's canon anyway uh you don't have to talk about this stuff with your players uh you can keep keep them keep them guessing that's actually even better so let's stir the pot um, this is the final kind of uh, creative challenge that I posted. Uh, we have to go back to the other one I wrote here. I'll reiterate this one, and then we'll go back to the next creative challenge. The city of Bells Pass is your classic Rust Belt industrial mid-level city with a population of close to half a million. There are roughly 25 kindred in the city, give or take one or another, and the prince, a Ventru former steel baron, recently disappeared, leaving a power vacuum. He had no childer, having lost his only due to a Sabbat conflict in the 90s, and never embraced after. The population distribution is two Banu Hakim, sire and child, with little political influence, <clears throat> four Bruja, two Anarchs, and two Camarilla loyalists, constantly arguing, one Gangrel, older than everyone else and very protective of the city, maybe not so much the kindred of it, three newly arrived La Sombra, all having come at separate times, Two Malkavians, both of whom were close friends with the prince since before the founding of Bells Past. Six Nosferatu, although only three that were known to the prince and the public, kept out of kindred affairs for the most part. Three Toreador, who maintain Elysium and the social circus of the city. A sire and her two childer. A Tremere Chantry, with one gargoyle protecting it. No known Tremere in the city. Two Ventru, unrelated to the prince, who served as his seneschal and sheriff, respectively. They have much influence in the city's law enforcement and city hall. Two Caitiff, who have come out of hiding since the prince's disappearance, an unknown quantity of Thinbloods. Your task is to design the new power structure of the city. There are no right or wrong answers. Focus on Prince and Primogen. Should there be any, why, why not? Will the prince have any actual real power or be a figurehead? Who are excluded from Primogen and why? What consequences do you see with your solution? If there is time, maybe think about the roles of Seneschal, Keeper of Elysium, Sheriff, Herald, and Harpy. We did this last week. Some of you have submitted your very cool uh, stories. So I'm gonna actually, in a, in a later video, I'm gonna go through them and kind of provide some feedback because I think those were really cool, really well done um, examples of how to do the city. Well, let's stir the pot. The Nosferatu Anarch Baron of a neighboring city is skeptical about the choice of prince you selected and is working to change the odds without getting personally involved. How do they do this and how does your prince and council handle it? So in this case, the, uh, a neighboring city's Baron, an Anarch Baron Nosferatu, is trying to change, um, change how things are working out in the city. A series of hostile... These are different scenarios, by the way, so you don't have to have them happen after each other. A series of hostile takeovers of businesses in Bell's past can be traced to a Hikata-founded group of young kindred 
who are looking to reinvigorate a town and essentially turn it into a giant money laundering activity, complete with casinos, hotels, and amusement parks. How would this affect the prince and council? <clears throat> Bell's Pass never had much Sabbat trouble, but suddenly it's swarmed with ex Sabbat canines who are ostensibly, or seemingly, looking for a fresh start. Overnight, the population of the city's kindred is almost doubled. What kind of effects might this have on the city, and how will the prince and council act on it? Hmm, interesting scenario there. These are, of course, individual, separate, potential scenarios. Don't take them all at once, because that would never happen. The newest elected mayor of town has the backings of the state senator, who wants them to be, quote-unquote, tough on crime in town. This means that all of a sudden, several kindred-backed officials find themselves in uncomfortable positions of scrutiny and red tape. Kindred influence over mortal affairs grind almost to a halt. What effect does this have on our city's kindred? And finally, Bell's Past's Tremere Chantry has remained abandoned for years, guarded only by a stone-faced gargoyle. Ab abandoned should be in quotation marks. We don't know. Suddenly, a mortal, a mage, approaches the Primogen Council during one of their get-togethers and requests permission to search the building. Let's leave out how they actually found the Primogen meeting and why they're not immediately killed. They are powerful enough not to be killed on the spot by any council member or the prince. What would the council and prince do? Hmm, interesting. So consider these different scenarios if you want, and comment down below. How would your city react to these kind of events happening. I do have an idea of how much time we have left. I uh, hope you, if you have any questions or comments, drop them in the comments section below. Um, I am working through the seminars, we still have seven more, but if there's anything specifically you'd like me to discuss, and keep in mind, these seminars are not like lore seminars that much, they're more about <coughs> the actual execution of a game uh, for players and storytellers, so this is more practical advice. So if you have any requests for practical advice you'd like to see me cover, uh, let me know. And of course, um, the video with my actual patrons, uh, that one's going to be kept secret forever. But uh, I am uploading this video very soon. I'm just going to add some cool music. Um, that's probably the hardest part of doing these videos is figuring out what music I'm going to be using. It has 52 minutes, which is the length of this video. That's a lot of music to cover, and I'm sure you're all kind of tired of listening to the Bloodlines soundtrack by now. So I'm going to keep digging, see if I can find some more music. And um, next video will be out hopefully next week, maybe a little bit early. I am late with this video. I apologize for that, but I wanted to deliver one as quickly as possible now. Uh, if you have um, any opinions, keep them to yourself. But if you really got to share them, drop them in the comments below. And thank you so much for watching. This has been a blast and I'm happy I get to try out my temporary model uh, before I move on to the real one, which will probably appear in January or February. It takes a little while to make these things. So thank you everyone for dropping by uh, and um, have a good one. And remember, stay safe out there for Gehenna will soon be upon us.